Dr. Hopkins for today. Um, Dr. Hopkins back on the introductions, and, and I believe Dr. Yancho is back on Nightflow. So I do appreciate her uh, giving the introductions of the past few weeks. Um, today we have a, uh, a really great presentation. I'd like to introduce uh, the speaker, Dr. John Hendrick, um, a graduate of the Medical College of Virginia, where he did medical school as well as his psychiatric residency there. Um, he is an associate professor of psychiatry at East Tennessee State University. Uh, he is the chief of psychiatry at the Mountain Home VA Medical Center. He is also a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association and a past president of the Tennessee Psychiatric Association. He has received an Irma J. Bland Award for Excellence in Psychiatric Residency Education. He has also been twice named an outstanding teacher in the ETSU Psychiatric Residency Program. Uh, he is the track director for neurosciences in the ETSU Department of Psychiatry. Um, and the, it, as part of the residency didactics program, and the VA and ETSU psych coordinator for the psychiatric residency program. Uh, he teaches clinically with residents and students and is very active in didactics teaching. His expertise is in brain and behavior. Thank you for speaking with us today. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, so in behavioral neurology, really the issue has always been how do we go about explaining consciousness? Consciousness is a very difficult topic. The easy thing is to philosophically describe what it is. The hard thing is to describe what the neuro, uh, neuroanatomy and neurophysiology is. No matter what ideas we use on consciousness, Freud's initial ideas, topographical theory about consciousness, the idea that there's an unconscious id, a subconscious, and an unconscious. This tripartite level of splitting of the idea of consciousness always matters in regards to understanding various theories of consciousness. Even Freud, though, soon after uh, elucidating the topographical theory, realized he had to move into the structural theory and that consciousness would include pieces of the ego, the superego, that most of the mind was, in fact, uh, unconscious, superego, the large portion of the ego, the id. And this structural theory then informed his ideas. And these ideas of consciousness, though 100 years old now, still maintain a baseline understanding of what we're talking about. Freud always wanted to know, in consciousness, and in psychopathology, where are these structures located? Now, obviously, we don't have an id, we don't have a superego delineated in the brain itself. But what we do here is motive drive, driving from the anterior cingulate cortex into the prefrontal cortex. You see the anterior cingulate in green here. And basically, this is the neurophysiologic equivalent of Freud's id, the site of motive drive. This information drives into the prefrontal cortex in Broadman areas 9 and 10 on both the right and the left sides for executive function and coordination. The left side is largely very analytic, the right side largely very emotional in its nature. And you'll notice here in Broadman's areas nine, you see a small insula here coming down to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and we'll come back to that later. The superego then, and I may have omitted to say then that the prefrontal cortex largely subserves ego function. The orbitofrontal cortex largely subserves superego function, and we know this from long experience with tumors in this region, meningiomas, various vascular injuries. And of course, Phineas Gage, who had a severe injury to this region, showed us that really language was located in this area and also showed us very clearly that emotional control was there. We'll come back to Mr. Gage in time. Now, in psychiatry, our chore basically is to assess first, is there an integrated brain? Does the brain function as it ought? And if so, then is there a reasonable coherence of mind? Psychopathology deteriorates this coherence. And if these things are basically understood, then we try and use the nature of our understanding of neurosciences, psychotherapy, psychiatry in general, in an empathic way to develop relationships with patients in an alliance that can lead to their betterment and welfare. Patterns in science are very interesting. We're going to talk about neurons, and I show you this because for all the world it looks like a neuron, 
But some of you may notice that the unit of measurement here, in fact, is a measurement of light years. This is a look at a nebula, a cosmological photograph out of a telescope. And from this, it's surprising how much it does look, in fact, like the resolutions we can get looking at neurons now. And there are several patterns that are very similar in overall science and similar in uh, behavioral neurology that I want to point out during the course of this lecture. The problem with looking at neurons is we understand much about the input layer. So at the perceptual level of input, we understand much of what's going on. And even in this area, we begin to have a good idea. This area, however, the hidden layer, the interconnections, the interconnections that exist, for instance, in the parietal association cortex and the reticular formation in many areas of the frontal lobe, these are hidden to our science at this point in time, as hidden as third messenger systems are inside the cell and inside the cell nucleus. The output layer, emotional output, behavior, uh, uh, locomotion, those things are much better understood. So we have, oops, we have understanding uh, at the input layer, the output layer, but we are still struggling with what's in between, what the networks look like. Now in perception, there are a variety of things that go on. First of all, perceptions interact with the frontal lobe in such a way that the frontal lobe then can begin to plan motoric output. Diencephalic and temporal lobe structures are very involved in deciding should a behavioral choice be made. Perception, largely visual perception, which is a major component of uh, perception in the brain, is split into a dorsal or a where stream off the superior colliculus and a later coming in evolution stream, the ventral stream, the what stream, which is responsible for object facial recognition, recognition of colors. So we see things and we perceive things chopped into chunks. And our brain then puts those chunks together for us. Now, this happens in microseconds of time, but there are episodic discontinuities in perception. And if I say to you, what do the syllables cho, fo, use mean, then you see they mean nonsense in this slide, but they make more, much more sense when we put them together in continuity. All parts of the brain have at least dual structure and function. Most have tripartite function. Here we see an interaction between prefrontal cortex, motor cortex, and hippocampus. And we see this as deciding how to make an activity using memory to decide how to structure that activity and then focusing the activity itself. This is an example of what I mean about dual structure. This is a DSI of the uh, cingulate gyrus, which normally, I've already talked about the anterior cingulate gyrus as being part of the id drive. This is the pathway from the frontal eye fields into the occipital and parietal association areas. So even though the cingulate gyrus in general is very much involved with integrating emotional structures out of the cephalon and the limbic system, it also has this information superhighway for frontal eye patterns. <coughs> In the limbic system itself, we see a key component. I'll come back to this several times of the cephaloamygdalar complex. The amygdala is very important in understanding fear and threat. The septum is the nuclei responsible for diminishing the intensity of fear and threat coming from the amygdala. Hypothalamic input is received to help the amygdala understand what the physiological reaction status is. Memory from hippocampus integrates into this. And then the septoamygdalar complex has unimodal input. A good example is olfactory sense, which drives directly into the septoamygdalar complex. Then polymodal sensory perceptions, which would include, for instance, the integration of hearing and vision. And then memory as well as amygdalar reactions and polymodal influences drive into a supramodal region of the brain into the parietal association area, especially that known as the angular gyrus, where most conscious associations are integrated. And we see the angular gyrus here as part of the loop from the anterior temporal lobe through Wernicke's area by way of the angular gyrus, and by way of the arcuate fasciculus into Broca's expressive area. 
So we see how these things come together, and in human consciousness, as opposed to consciousness that may be experienced by primates, this particular arc on the left side of the brain is tremendously influential in coordinating human thought, experience, and consciousness. In order to do this, three very important nuclei of the basal forebrain are involved. The nucleus accumbens, which is involved in reward, in schizophrenia, and certainly in, uh, for instance, cocaine addiction, is part of this troika of nuclei. The septal nucleus, which I've already mentioned, turning off amygdalar influences. And then the nucleus basalis of Maynard, that famous nucleus associated with Alzheimer's disease and acetylcholine. So these are the three basal forebrain nuclei that are very involved in emotional gating and control in the front brain. Here's a good look at the septal area, and you see the basalis nucleus of Maynard below it. Many of you that had to struggle with brain section slides will remember having to memorize the diagonal band of Broca. And everybody was thinking, what in the heck is that anyway? Well, it's the white matter tract between the nucleus basalis of Maynard and the septal region. So now you have a, a sense of why you were asked to learn that at one time. Here's a look at the dopamine pathways driving into the same region with the nucleus accumbens represented here. And we see the um, uh, nigrostriatal and mesocortical tracts as well as the mesolimbic tract. So we're missing tubero infundibular in this particular picture. The concept of the extended amygdala is very important to understanding behavioral neurology and um, neurosciences in general these days. Now, here you'll see the yellow section, which really is the fornix, and you see the gray lines kind of protruding out of the fornix. Uh, these gray lines are the stria terminalis, and they are going basically from the amygdala in green by way or closely associated to the fornix to the um, nucleus accumbens. And then in blue here, you see the septal nuclei. You see the nucleus accumbens also coursing a tract of the stria terminalis to the red mammillary bodies. And you see the stria terminalis pushing through its bed nucleus. I wanted you to see these relationships as later as we talk about optogenetics, I'll show you some specifics about it. The concept of extended amygdala is interesting because the basal ganglia have always been thought to basically stand alone, if you will. But it's known that the head of the caudate, in fact, has bidirectional connections to the frontal lobes. And it's never been clear why that is, because otherwise the basal ganglia generally has descending influence from cortex. And one of the uh, reasons that this is very important is because the new way of looking at this is the head of the caudate, and in fact, the entire caudate nucleus itself, may actually be better conceptualized as the tail of the amygdala. So we may have ourselves kind of turned around on the function. So then, in the basal ganglia itself, the ventral striatum, or the ventral basal ganglia, include the nucleus accumbens again. Nucleus accumbens is a very important integrating area and is certainly impaired in schizophrenia. But other ventral striatal structures include the substantia nigra, or the ventral tegmental area, and the subthalamic nucleus. You see the subthalamic nucleus and substantia nigra here, and if you came forward in the brain here, you would see an ascending pathway from substantia nigra into nucleus accumbens. And interestingly, there is a glutaminergic descending pathway. Now, dopamine is ascending into the nucleus accumbens. It's excitatory in that tract. And then the glutamine pathway is, of course, excitatory. So the entire system should run out of control. It doesn't, though because of GABA interneurons at the level of the substantia nigra that act for thermostatic control of the system for balance. The human brain is very interesting. Homo sapiens evolved about 250 million years ago once we had some uh, reptilian complex in our brain. And over time, 100 million years or maybe 150, the limbic system began to develop around the reptilian complex uh, and then, about 50 million years ago, the neocortex brought us into what can now be referred to as Homo sapiens sapiens, Homo sapiens who know that they know. We know such things because, for instance, we can teach at a level that, um, for instance, chimpanzees, macaques cannot. And we see here why this is true. 
the human frontal lobes are tremendously large. And you would think that the frontal lobe size in and of itself was the reason why this is important. But in fact, what's really important is the total number of synaptic connections in the cortico-cortical association neurons. That's what makes the real difference in the human. Uh, so the frontal lobe is large per capita in human compared to our peers, or near peers. Uh, the limbic lobe per capita, its actual acreage is really not much larger in the human brain than it is in other brains, at least when compared to total brain size. So the limbic lobe itself has been around for a very long time, hasn't changed particularly a lot. It's the cortico to cortico associational regions that are so important. Here we see prefrontal cortex at newborn, very few cells, paucity of cells. At a month, it's filling in, nine months filling in dramatically, and at two years, it is overfilled. Apoptosis then allows into adulthood the coordination of neurons that become now highly organized, highly structured, and extremely synaptically sophisticated by long-term potentiation learning. And we see in the adult the more coordinated prefrontal cortex than that of a two-year-old. This is a look at the cortical surface. We're going to look at the cortex now for a while. The cortico-cortical association neurons are at the inner office level. The inbox from the thalamus is at the fourth level, and the outbox is at the sixth level. The cingulate gyrus, for instance, also has six levels, but the cellularity is not differential in four and six in the cingulate gyrus. Uh, whereas the bidirectional input and output of cortex to thalamus is crucial for cortical activation. Over on the side here, um, you might notice this is what's called a microcolumn. It's a group of about 100 neurons. It's an often studied group in behavioral neurology, just groups of that size. Look here at confocal microscopy, and you kind of get a sense of the cellularity here. This section is level 6. The red line here is level five. This is four, then three is about here. Two and one blend together at the top. So you get a sense of the complex structure of these synaptic interconnections, cortical interfaces. The cortex, of course, has tremendously different factors of activity. The right brain is largely used for exploring and staying aware of the gestalten of our environment. The left brain for anatomic, uh, and analytical assessment of the world. And this is also true subcortically. For instance, the amygdala on the left wants to win in a challenge, but the amygdala on the right wants to avoid losing in a challenge. And this has tremendous evolutionary implication. Now, terrestrial beings like humans tend to have uh, a little bit more organization towards left-handed or right-handed structure. Dolphins may have actually larger brains than we do by volume, but if you look at them, their brains are extremely symmetrical. Well, this makes sense. They have to be prepared for challenge left, right, dorsal, ventral, from any direction, anterior, posterior. So their brain should be relatively symmetrical. Also, while they have vocalization, they don't have verbalization. And so the left human brain is filled with that arcuate siculus and its attendant nuclei. And that makes a huge difference in the way brains are. As you see lower levels of evolution, you see more lysencephaly in the brain. You see a smoothing of the gyrations. The gyrations are critical for allowing information processing and enough surface area to accommodate all the cortico-cortical connections. The right brain can be tested like this. If I read the first line, if I'm correct, I read it green, red, blue. I have to actually work hard to do that because, of course, I want to read yellow, blue, orange. That's very easy. That's my left brain being in charge of the analytical idea. Your right brain can be forced to speak its awareness but you do have to work very hard to make the right brain uh, take over the verbalization apparatus. What you don't have to do is work hard for it to assess emotions and the prosody of words. So I could say, gosh, I love my dog. 
I could say, wow, I really love my dogs. And there's a real difference in the prosody of the two things that I said there. Not only the volume, but also the intensity with which I pronounce that. That's a right brain function. Also, musical functions are in the brain. And so, left brain is analytical, tends to be sequential. Right brain tends to be imaginative and interpersonal. The interpersonal is very much driven by limbic factors, and the imaginative and the analytical very much driven by cerebral. The dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is another reason, region of the frontal cortex that is impaired. I showed you in that first uh, slide, Brodman's area 9 and 10, I showed there was a little insular projection down in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. We'll come back to this region. Like the nucleus accumbens, it's very impaired in schizophrenia. And that makes some sense because its basic process is to evaluate self-generated information about yourself. Well, if that includes, for instance, uncontrollable auditory hallucinations, you can have a very distorted view of self. The brain is largely a visual transduction device. Auditory input as well as somatosensory input, also very important. But about 50 to maybe as much as 80% of all neurons and brain function in general can be associated with visual awareness. And you see here in the fusiform gyrus the advanced feature detectors for object and face recognition. This is the ventral pathway of perception. And there are other perceptual things that we need to take note of. For instance, the insula. The insula cortex, a medial portion of the temporal lobe, has an anterior and posterior region. It's very involved in gustatory response. So uh, the next time you have gourmet food and wine, you can thank your insula for letting you experience it. But then in the other hand, the next time you're driving down Rhone Street and the uh, police blue lights come on on your rearview mirror, your gut twists into a knot, you can thank your insula for its visceroidiomotor action in terms of translating your concerns about the risks of the environment into literally your gut. Now this uh, lavender section here is the angular gyrus and where all somatosensory, visual, auditory, visceroidiomotor input, memory, emotion, where these things are coordinated together is in the parietal lobe. It's tempting for us when talking about consciousness to think that the parietal lobe has a little theater there. Okay? It's been described as theater of the mind, as if there were little uh, you know, actors working out in the stage. Of course, that's not what it is. And we're going to talk about the fact that the brain, in fact, has digital and analog computation basis. And that's what's actually going on in these association zones. A large part of it is programmed genetically. Okay, so for instance, the corpus callosum is essentially genetically programmed. Many of you know that agenesis of the corpus callosum is a known malformation, and that's where the gene GS plane doesn't work. On the other hand, in the frontal lobe, it's more genetic than it is learned, but there's plenty of room for learning uh, involvement in the frontal lobe. The temporal lobe is a little less than half genetic. The parietal lobe is largely pre-programmed. And this is where such things as visual, spatial skills, logic, and mathematics reside. And interestingly, the visual lobe is not as uh, pre-programmed as we would think. You would kind of think that the occipital lobe would be very genetically programmed and not much available to learning, but that's not true. Learning can change all the areas of the brain, except for maybe the corpus callosum. Now, Understanding how these things are connected and how they work require a look at the human connectome. And we're working on this project. It's developing tremendously and we're understanding more and more. In this first picture, you see some dissection of an MRI. Then you see mathematical dissection. The red dots are called nodes. And then you see a reconstruction of neuronal pathways using DSI techniques that give us a very real sense of these connections. So to do this, you get a brain, you get a piece of the brain, you cut it very thin, you image it, you reconstruct it in a computer graphic, you visualize and analyze it, and then you build it into, for instance, <coughs> nodes and connectomes. An interesting thing about the nodes and connectomes here, in particular, you notice the nodes on the right side are actually kind of larger. Well, that, why is that? because the right brain, again, 
is in this kind of subconscious way constantly watching the environment. And each of these nodes can be thought of, the new term is rich club, rich club network. And the idea is, much like country clubs in rich cities have plenty of influential people that gather together there and make plans for the direction of that community. Okay, and it's done kind of over, uh, over drinks and cigars or over who knows what. Okay, but the right brain and these nodes in general are like rich clubs making plans for what the brain is going to do. The Connectome project has become sophisticated enough that the mathematical devices can be used to reconstruct prior injury. Many of you will know that this is Phineas Gage's skull. The gray rods stuck through his eye socket in his uh, left frontal lobe are the injury he obtained in 1848. And they've gone back, taken 144 normal uh, humans, uh, got the DSI structures of the brain. They've looked at Gage's very well described anatomical injury. And if you notice in particular, this brown zone right here is the part of the right frontal lobe that the tamping rod got when Gage was injured in this explosion. And interestingly enough, they've grown sophisticated enough that they can plot the connectome in a circuit graph of this nature. And these brown connectors right here are the right-sided brown connectors that were actually injured in Phineas Gage. That's pretty sophisticated mathematics applied to behavioral neuro. This is a first 3D map of an owl uh, monkey brain. Very good look at how this technique can be used to elucidate these structures. We're looking here at corticospinal tracts in the corpus callosum. Okay, corpus callosum, wrapping around here. It's thick blue corticospinal tracts. Okay. And one of the things we've discovered is we've had increasing resolutions on these DSI projects. Look at how intricately these fibers are interwoven. It is amazing. These white matter tracts, it's like they were, in fact, stitched by hand. Some of you may be somewhat familiar with this particular part of Psalms. It actually, I think, fits very effectively into a discussion of being knitted together. Now, we'll come back to that. And at this point, I want to look at an individual neuron again. I want to point something out. The dendritic tree here is basically the analog part of this computer feeding into the cell body and feeding from the cell body here into the axon hillock. Now at the axon hillock, a different thing occurs. The axon hillock is either going to fire or not fire to allow information exchange to occur. So the axon hillock, in fact, becomes a digital device, not an analog device. But as it decides to fire and information transfer comes down, we get again into the synaptic base of the axon, which becomes again analog. So we're going to talk in a bit about blood-brain barrier. And we're going to talk about the brain as an analog digital computer that is based on a solid liquid interface. And it is an amazing organ for that. You see the knitting here, again of the white matter tracks as they interact together. And you see how complicated these interactions and how distinctively involved these interactions are. Some of the medical students heard me talking about some of this yesterday in their M3 class. One of the points that I make is, while norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine are small neurotransmitter systems, they are the systems that are necessary for this complex morphogenetic structure to learn how to orient itself one tract next to another, leading from one neuron to another, to nuclear sites. We can use blue-green algae pro, or, uh, um, photopigments. We can put them in viruses and then infect neural cells with them. And we can get as many as 90 different colors so that we can really see the cellular difference and even begin to get looks in this reticulum that you see up here at what I would refer to again as the hidden layer of the brain. We can begin to use these techniques to get a look at how to define these things. Now this is a computer reconstruction of uh, bipolar cells from mouse retina. And it's very beautiful in and of itself. Its arrangement is amazing. But also we can use fractal mathematics to begin to program these things. 
And again, through the use of this mathematical structure and understanding these interrelationships here between layer one and layer two, understanding this, if we could do so mathematically, would begin to also help us understand hidden layers of the brain. These are DSIs of large tracts. Some of you have heard me talk about antisocial behavior. This is the uncinate fasciculus and incoherence of neural transmission in the uncinate fasciculus is thought to be integrated with sociopathy and psychopathy. Um, we see here, again, red is corticospinal tract. This is the arcuate fasciculus, so um, Wernicke's angular gyrus brocus, several other tracts there. So, we've been through some of the high-tech things. We're going to come back to other things we can do with the high-tech information, but I'm going to review just a minute some about the uh, history of the limbic system. Basically, Mayberg has clearly described a lateral limbic system for pleasure and reward and a medial limbic system that is basically for memory. And historically, Paul Broca described the limbic system in terms of its middle arc, okay? And Broca was really the first one to give us a true insight into the limbic system. Papes then uh, gave us a look at the inner arc of the limbic system, the Papes circuit, including the mammillary bodies, fornix, alveus, fimbria, the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. So Papes got us aware of the inner arc, and the third arc really waited for Paul McLean to describe. And this included such areas as subcolossal um, region of the anterior cingulate, the septal nuclei, the uncus, the uh, uncle uh, lobe that I've shown you previously, the subiculum of the hippocampus. So these three were pioneers of behavioral neurology and their ideas, for instance, Pape's circuit is no longer considered to be what it was when he described it as the emotional toning circuitry of the brain. But still, it is very important because it describes the fact that all significant limbic input goes essentially to the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. That remains very true and borne out all the time. Here's a good look at the limbic system and its rounded and ovoid structures. Okay. Um, and you can kind of get a sense here. Here's the amygdala. Here's, do I have, yeah, here's the caudate wrapping around, okay? And you can kind of see how it could be that the caudate is in fact the extended tail of the amygdala. It's a different way to look at the brain, but one that makes a lot of sense from the things that we know, especially as we know more about the frontal lobe. For instance, when we look at these two faces, I don't think there'd be any debate in here as to which one is angry and which one is calm. If there is, you need to see me later. And meanwhile, uh, the amygdala reacts to this angry face, okay? And it also recognizes the calm face. And part of that is the frontal lobe responding to each of these, the amygdala making a fast assessment and the basal ganglia becoming involved in what to do about that fast assessment. So the neocortex represents an overarching inhibitory structure that sits directly over top of the limbic system. The limbic system, a system that sits over top of the diencephalic structures, all of which sit in top of the brainstem. And interestingly, the brainstem has nuclear control of much of the diencephalon, limbic, and neocortex, bringing us to the idea of reentrant pathways as a mechanism of describing how the brain actually works. Stimulus loops and reentrant pathways are very important in our current understanding of why these white matter tracts we're mapping are so very important. Stress then can be translated from the hypothalamus portion of the diencephalon into the human body and is uh, also I should mention that in the hypothalamus if the mammillary bodies are bilaterally infarcted consciousness can be completely abated. So as I say to students all the time give your alcoholics thiamine as a matter of fact, give thiamine to anybody with substance abuse problems. So we don't want to see that happen. The brain reward circuit is very involved, of course, with pain control. And lately, psychiatry has become increasingly involved with pain control. Why? Because areas that we're very involved in, for instance, dopamine into the nucleus accumbens, 
nucleus accumbens feeding back into the medial dorsal thalamus, or this particular portion would be the habinula, okay, and then feeding down into the interpeduncular area. These are heavily involved pain regions, and you can see them a little more clearly here. In red are the dopamine pathways, feed back then to the habinula, feed down to the interpeduncular nucleus, which can exert influence and control here at the level of the central gray where endorphins exist. So in this way, we can employ the use of antidepressants, antipsychotics, and other psychiatric medications to attenuate problems with analgesia. Get a look here at the neurotransmitters coming out of the midbrain, and this gives you an idea how the midbrain feeds back to the diencephalic, limbic, and cortical structures, and how much of these are in reentrant loops. Most of the dopamine in the brain is in the basal ganglia, okay? The turnover in the limbic striatum, which is the ventral striatum, very, very high, okay? Um, the cholinergic cell bodies are also high because we have nucleus basalis of Maynard there. And then in the dorsal striatum, the caudate has a lesser role than the putamen in, in motor control. Globus pallidus has a mixed activity of emotional and motor control. And caudate itself gets most of its input from that uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Again, a rationale for why dysfunction in this area is very important in schizophrenia. The head of the caudate is an interesting thing. In evolution, the recurrent artery of Huebner actually seems to have come about to be sure that the head of the caudate has its own individualized arterial supply, which is unusual for a brain region in some ways. The DLPFC then plays a role in sustaining attention and working memory, and you can see how lesions in this area can in interfere with judgment. For instance, some of the exotic judgments that we see schizophrenics making. The left brain is more likely to be negating of decisions, and the right brain more likely to be affirming. Meanwhile, the left amygdala wants to win, but the right brain wants to not lose. So there's a balance between the cortex and the amygdalas on either side. Another thing that's very important in understanding behavioral neurology is realizing not all receptors are the same. Polymorphisms are, of receptors are very important. So for instance, we've talked a lot about the frontal lobe, which is mostly D1 receptors. Now D1 is inhibitory dopamine receptor. D2 in the basal ganglia, excitatory. The brain also has an electrical current pulse that is routinely generated probably from the interlaminar nuclei of the thalamus and other brain pacemakers. But the interlaminar nuclei are very responsible for this 40 hertz pulse that drive such things as the EEG. Now, the brain is constructed in such a way as to drive the EEG in irregularity. That's what we want to see. Regular EEG spikes we call seizures, okay? So unlike the heart, which wants a regular beat, the brain wants a very irregular pacer. Well, a regular pacer made irregular by the cortex. And the cortex will influence this pacemaker in such ways to direct different pacers to different areas of the cortex for various activities used. In consciousness, Denon's general idea is that we experience the extrapersonal space or the plenum and we see objects in that space, we then use our intrapsychic apparatus to translate that into information that can be transducted into our overall selves, including our body. In consciousness, there is the problem of what is red? Why do you see red instead of blue? Well, part of it, of course, is the wavelength that red absorbs, but more importantly, the brain has comparators in the hidden level. And so, at the hidden level, you see here, this is just three levels of comparators. The hidden level is comparing the spot that you see to tell you if it is similar to what you historically know as red. Our brains actually choose our actions sometimes as much as 10 seconds, not 10 milliseconds, 10 seconds before our activity. So in fact, I would argue we really don't have free will. We have free won't. Of the thousand things you could do 10 seconds from now, 999 of them will be eliminated and the one that you do will be the one that you chose.
So it's a very interesting way to look at how consciousness works. It's very hard to describe on synaptic or neuronal levels how the brain could be large enough to be a computer sophisticated enough to hold consciousness, but it does somehow. Qubits are the digital interactions between protein interfaces and microtubules in the neurons. And you see here a qubit in the blue and the red forms. That is a zero or a one form. You see a look at an artist's rendering of the relationship of the microtubules. And you see here how qubits can cross and how there may be actually enough qubit interactions in the microtubule structures of the neurons of the brain. There may be a large enough number to actually make a quantum interface and to actually use quantum theory to predict how consciousness can arise from the brain. And you see these microtubule interactions. You can imagine each one of these little uh, Z-shaped areas right there. These are protein interfaces. At any given point in time, there are infinite numbers of ways that they could be in relation to one another, allowing, therefore, for the idea that quantum theory may be able to eventually help us understand consciousness in the brain. Whatever the underlying mechanism of consciousness, consciousness certainly is about what we all do all the time, developing an opinion. So our salience network helps us to develop an opinion. For instance, if you get pain in your spinothalamic tract, you're going to develop an opinion about that very quickly. Okay? And why did I lose the slide here? Ah, good. Right now you're developing an opinion. Some of you see the vase. Some of you see the two faces. It doesn't matter which one you saw. At least by the time I finished telling you what was there, you had already made the phase shift. You had already learned to see either the vase or the two faces, no matter what the first one you perceived was. This again, like the cho fo use chop house word, is an idea. You get a piece of it, and then you put the gestalt of the entire thing together. This is done through the use of your connectome control consensus. Many of you saw the faces first and the vase only secondarily, but that's because the right brain took a minute to learn to see both. The hippocampus, of course, is involved in that learning process. And the hippocampus was the first model in which we fully understood these reentry mechanisms, reentrant mechanisms. Memories go around and around and around in the hippocampus until they stick. And you've all had that experience. You're sitting there. I, I know all the PGY4s are studying very hard for my neuroanatomy class, and they're all sitting there going, okay, this is the nucleus cuneatus, the nucleus cuneatus, the nucleus cuneatus. What are its relationships? I know they're all doing that. Right, Jeremiah? That's what you guys do at night? I know you do. Every night, Jeremiah says. Well, in fact, what happens is, as he does it over and over again, the AMPA receptors are being bombarded by glutamate, and when it finally dawns on him, that that nucleus is in this relation to the structures around it, all of a sudden the NMDA receptors open up, calcium flows in, this synapse causes the dendrite to have great depolarization. So this two receptor model of this huge glutaminergic system, 20 billion neurons in the brain at least, allow for that kind of study and these reentrant pathways to turn into long-term potentiated learning. The presence of calcium in the synapse is critical. If the astrocytic foot pads disallow calcium at any given moment in time, this synapse cannot break loose this synaptic vesicle. So if the calcium is not there and the calcium's presence is controlled by the astrocyte, if it's not there, the information transfer will not occur. If the information transfer does occur, a second messenger evolves inside the cell, and a third messenger comes with nuclear involvement. Now, right now in behavioral neurology, much like the hidden layer, we don't have a good understanding. We have a good understanding of the second messenger as it drives down towards the nucleus, but as it gets there, we get lost. We don't have good enough probes, and the third messenger system is more of a conceptualization. We know uh, that inside cytoplasm there are third messengers. We really don't understand them. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I don't. But on the other hand, we know this. Not only is calcium important, but 
the presence or absence of hormones in given regions can make huge differences in this first, second, and third messenger system. Now this is why the brain is a liquid solid interface. This is the arterial tree of the brain. And there's a tremendous amount of blood in these arteries, of course. There's a tremendous amount of extracellular fluid in the synaptic space. But all of the solid construction of the brain is necessary for consciousness to exist, as is the proper arrangement in association with the liquid portion of the brain. So we have analog and digital computation, liquid and solid interface computer. That liquid and solid interface is maintained by the blood-brain barrier. Much energy has to go into keeping chemicals in the proper place inside and outside of synapses and the vascular regions of the brain. So the blood-brain bar barrier has very tight capillaries. But the astrocytic foot processes that I just referred to that can control calcium are also very much involved in this blood-brain barrier. So the astrocytes themselves used to be thought as simply structurally supporting regions and areas of interest of the brain, but in fact can turn the calcium on and off and can use input from the capillary system to determine whether or not to do that. So the brain is a very complex computer indeed. Some regions of the brain have very loose blood-brain barrier, uh, such as the vomiting center. Um, back in the day, if I'm walking through the woods 50,000 years ago, if I eat the green berries and I hallucinate for three days and vomit for a day and a half of those three days, I should learn not to eat those green berries again. Um, of course, I don't know how many of you like to hallucinate. That's not my business. <laughs> Tell me about that later. Uh, but the point is that the blood-brain barrier there has to be very porous so that if you get alkaloids that could poison you, you will throw them up before they do. In traumatic brain injury, okay, you can imagine here that these little lines are microtubules. Here is a crushed, concussed neuron. And you can see the disruption in the microtubules. And if you think about consciousness as a manifestation of the microtubular integrity, you can see then how complicated a closed or a penetrating head injury could be in terms of crushing these delicate items that are liquid interface digital analog computer activities. Okay? When you get these gross brain injuries, uh, they can be very serious. Now here's a look at the connectome, and I mentioned that I was going to talk about patterns in science. This is the human brain connectome. It looks a lot like this. I bet many of you have been on plane seats and looked at this particular map. Okay? This is an example of what we might call the rich club network of uh, Delta Airlines. Okay? And this is an example of what we might call the rich club network of the human brain. And look what sits right in the middle of all of it. Not surprisingly, the amygdala. Oops. Oh, I see what I did. Okay. Here's a look at frontal projection fibers. Okay. Very much part of a connectome. And here's a connectome. You can see the little green dots are very influential nodes. You see them here at the anterior temporal lobes. We're not exactly sure the full function of the anterior temporal lobes, especially not on the right side. Uh, you see them here in the area of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, That's connectome structure. The brain then has a salience network where opinions are developed. The central executive, or the ego portion of the brain, if you will, the one that I talked about earlier. And the default mode network. Okay? Each of them have different relationships. Default mode and executive control tend to be related more to the uh, posterior cingulate cortex, the salient network, is involved with motives coming out of the anterior cingulate cortex, and different regions of the frontal lobe get involved in either the default mode network, which is medial, or the executive control network, which is more frontal. So, uh, default mode is reflective consciousness, and saliency and executive network are more pre-reflective. Okay, I'll let you look those things up. In mindfulness, one of the things we try and do is access the default mode network effectively to allow the millions of associations we have going by all the time to set aside 
so that we can simply be. Not an easy chore. Because recurrent pathways constantly are involved in the hidden layer. We are constantly working through these hidden layer processes. You see these reentrant loops and you see how they're connected with white matter tracks through the brain. And these reentry loops can include things like, for instance, the nucleus accumbens core about emotions, extended amygdala, assessing the nature of environmental threat. So what can we do with all this information? I've gotten that question before. What do I do with all this? Well, one of the things that's happening is optogenetics. I said before we can take blue-green algae and we can get photopigments from them and they will react to blue light. We can insert them into neurons and we can get light responsive ligands inside cells, okay? Getting the genetic constructs, put them in a virus, put them in a rat, take the rat, put a fiber cable in, shine the blue light in, and then things change. Well now, why? Interestingly, the lateral hypothalamus, the lateral compartment of the hypothalamus has only one nucleus, the lateral hypothalamus. Obesely morbid rats due to lateral hypothalamic lesions are constantly eating, constantly hungry, and they get very, very obese. We can put this kind of an insert into the lateral hypothalamus of a morbidly obese rat, so lesioned. We can do that, and then when the rat goes to feed, we can turn on the blue light, and when it comes on, the rat will opt not to feed. So that alone is a very interesting comment about the nature of obesity and how this behavioral control might eventually be able to leave the rat. You see the rat here, you know it's the rat because I remember all of you remember they have smooth gyri on the brain. Here's the basal nucleus of the stria terminalis. You can use this light, for instance, to turn on and off these gabaergic projections. Eventually, I think we'll be able to put nanowire sensors into that arterial tree of the brain. We'll be able to navigate to where we need to be for this kind of thing. And we'll be able to have these light sources available. Okay, already we have implants in the brain, for instance, for pain. Uh, they're not light implants, but they're electrical implants. I've certainly had several patients with them. This is a rat with Parkinson's disease, hydrogenically uh, induced Parkinson's disease, being treated at the level of the subthalamic nucleus with light. The Clarity Project, initiated by Carl Deseroth, this guy probably deserves a Nobel Prize, in my opinion, he has learned how to take rat brains, and he'll be able to do this with any kind of brain. He can inject it with India ink in any tract, those DSI tracts that I showed you earlier. Uh, for instance, the unsinate fasciculus could be injected, an example. He can then inject it with India ink there, preserve that tract. He can take a rat brain like this and over two days pass it through a series of chemical solutions. And while you don't see the brain here, it is in fact there. It's just gone clear. Okay, he's managed to take all the myelin and all the lipid out of the brain, and the brain still exists. If it were injected with India ink, you'd be able to see whatever tract had been injected. It's an amazing process. And using the Clarity Project, we can inject these tracts and then use computers and fractal mathematics, which I discussed earlier, to develop pictures like this that will, in fact, allow us to begin to understand the hidden layer <coughs> connections of the brain. And so, that's where behavioral neurology is going. Carl Jung predicted it long ago. And when I finally get burned out of looking inside myself to try and awaken myself to what's going on in behavioral neurology, like occasionally look to the social world and those that I love. And that would be these people. So with that, I'll finish. Thank you. That picture, by the way, was courtesy of Dr. Newt Agarwal. What a good job he did with it. Ah, questions? Janet. 
Yeah, I think it would probably be the central nucleus of the amygdala that changes its innervations. Um, there's a lateral and a central nucleus. That would be my guess. You know, I'm so tempted to tell you to talk to Jay about this because I put that slide in just for Jay Griffith, okay? And I thought he would like it, and uh, I, I'll be happy to hand it off to him. He knows more about this than I do, I think. And in particular, um, it is a very interesting idea, though, because I think many, right now in the VA in particular, there are a tremendous amount of grants out in California looking at virtual reality therapy, and that's the kind of goal that they're trying to achieve, and how to track that neurophysiologically will be very important. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. The therapies, the, video, the videography therapies are tremendously interesting. Um, unfortunately, we don't have them at places like Mountain Home yet, but we're working on it, right? Jay and I have plans. Other questions? Well, I thank you all very much for coming.